did and don't worry, your neighbor did. We are in Mark chapter 10. We are in Mark chapter 10. Amen. I hope your neighbor brought the Bible for you guys. Use your Bible, use your phone. We're in Mark 10. And we want to read a familiar passage of scripture. I'm sure most of you have probably heard this story. Mark 10, our custom here is when we find it, we say, Amen. Amen. It says, Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and stood still and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Watch this, take courage and stand up. He is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, or Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. I want to take our title this afternoon from verse 49. It says, Take courage and get up. Amen. I don't know if y'all heard me. Take courage. Amen. And get up. You don't even have to touch them to do this, but can you just turn to your neighbor and tell them, take courage and get up. Come on, they didn't believe you. Turn to the neighbor that you like and tell them, take courage and get up. Amen. If you believe that, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Most of you are aware we have been in a series in the Gospel of Mark. We've entitled this series... The gospel of action, because Mark is writing to the Romans who are a people of action, and so he must present Christ as a man of action. He is a Messiah on a mission. Our key verse has been Mark 10:45. I hope you learned it by now. It says, "The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve." Y'all got it, and to give his life, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, in the first half of the book. We find this mission, missionary Messiah, he is serving. In the second half of the book, he is giving his life as a ransom for many. I want to give you just a quick review of last week where we surveyed the transfiguration in Mark chapter 9. Remember that he took Peter, James, and John, and we saw that he took them up. His glory came out. Moses and Elijah came yeah. down, and the glory cloud came over them. Today our attention is drawn to, I think, one of Preacher's favorite personages, Blind Bartimaeus. I think we do him a disservice and an injustice, and he'll probably have a moment with us preachers when we get to heaven, because for some reason we still call him Blind Bartimaeus. We still call her the woman with the issue of blood. We still call the man in Acts 3 the paralytic at the gate. Yeah. And I want to remind you today, Bartimaeus is no longer blind. We should call him Bartimaeus who was blind. Yeah. We should call her the woman who had an issue of blood. Amen. We should call him the man who was a paralytic at the right. gate. Right. So I'm not going to preach very long this afternoon, but uh, as is our custom, I just want to give you three things. I hope you're taking notes. Consider, first and foremost, his position. Would you say that with me? His position. His position. His position. And the truth is, Bartimaeus is in a pitiful state. Mm -hmm. If I can just be real, he is in a sorry place. Yeah. Come on. Uh, first and foremost, because this man is blind. Scholars and theologians debate how long he had been blind for, but it seems that most scholars tend to believe this man has been blind for a very long time with the possibility that he may have even been born blind. We don't know for certain. The text 
doesn't tell us, but one thing we do know is that those were very different times. There, there was no surgery then. There was no insurance. There, there was no Medicare. This, this man was blind. There was no LASIK surgery. There, there were no... Right. This was a time where his condition almost defined him. It's not just that he was blind, but he's also a beggar. He is poor. He inadvertently doesn't even know where his next meal is coming from. Yeah. Imagine, it's enough to be blind, but he is both blind and a beggar, having to depend upon others' generosity for his own survival and sustenance. And as if to add insult to injury, he is blind, he is a beggar, watch this, and his name is Bartimaeus. That's significant because Bar means son of, we have to ask the question, then what does Timaeus mean? That's his father's name. And if something is holy in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it, it's called Tamim. Uh, like the Lord said to Abraham, he said, walk before me and be Tamim, and be perfect, be holy, be complete. Mm -hmm. But Tame is the opposite of it. Mm -hmm. It means unholy. Yeah. It literally means unclean. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are watching this. He's blind, he's a beggar, and he is literally named the son of uncleanliness. Yeah. Wow. I have to believe this man wrestled with his identity for most of his life, asking questions like, why am I thus? Why was I born into this family? Why is unholy my last name? <laughs> so he is blind, he is a beggar, and he is the son of uncleanliness. Yeah. We could go down the list of all of the negative things happening in Bartimaeus' life. But there's one thing you can't take from him. He is blind. He is a beggar. And he is the son of uncleanliness. But watch this. This is the one thing he has going for him. He's in the right place. Oh, he's in the right place place. He, he's in the right city at least. He, he's in Jericho. He's blind, but he's in the right place. He, he's a beggar, but he's in the right place. He, he's the son of uncleanliness, but he is in the right place. The right place. I'm with you, Sister Perla. We, we prayed and we talked and we researched and we studied and, and we thought about, should we even have service today? But I got to tell you, just walking through those doors, I believe we're in the right but I just got to tell you, something happens when God's people gather together and begin to lift up his name. I, I know there's a lot of things going on in our life, but at least he got this going for you today. You're in the right place. You're, you're in the house of the Lord with God's people. How sweet and how pleasant it is for God's... I'm going to slow down. I don't have a lot of time. But I read somewhere, wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is. In the midst of us. Somebody should Lord. say, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. Pastor, what do you mean Bartimaeus was in the right place? All of you Bible readers remember Jericho. You'll remember that in Joshua chapter 6, this is the first city that they had to conquer to take the promised land. Come on. <laughs> it, it's known for its fortified walls. It was thought to be impenetrable. No one had ever taken the city. But you'll remember the instructions of the Lord to Joshua. He said, once a day for six days, I need you guys to not say a word and just march around that city. He said, on the seventh day, I need you to march around it seven times. And on that seventh time, I need you to raise that shofar and I need you to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You, you know the story that they began to shout and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down as they shouted with a Shabbat praise unto the Lord. I, I'm convinced that maybe the reason Bartimaeus is in Jericho is because maybe he was at least biblically astute enough to make the connection that God had moved before in Jericho. And if God has moved here before, surely he can move here again. I don't know who I'm talking to this afternoon, but I just need to remind you, if God did it before, he 
again. He can do it again. Jericho was known as a place where God has given victory. Jericho was a place that was known that no walls would stand before the praises of the Lord. And so I think that Bartimaeus was in Jericho because he had enough faith to deduce that if God did it here before, God can still do it again. Who am I preaching to this afternoon? You just need to be assured God can do it again. God, God can save your marriage again. God can get you out of debt again. God can put you on the right track again. God can bring home rebellious sons and daughters again. God can heal cancer. If he's done it before, he can do it again. Church, this is not the first time. We have been threatened with pandemics and infirmities and diseases. It's not the first time that we have survived something. If it's happened before, guess what? God can do it again. The Lord has seen generations through the bubonic plague, through smallpox, through polio, through Ebola, through swine flu, through SARS, through cholera, through tuberculosis, you name it. But what they all have in common is these are all names of diseases that all have to bow at the name that is above COVID-19 to the list this afternoon and, and just remind every infirmity that it has to bow at the name of Jesus Christ. He, the Lord has seen us through all of this before. He'll do it again. I don't know if you believe it. I said he'll do it again. He'll do it again. He, he saves his people. That's what his word promises. When destruction came to the world, he took Noah and his family, put him on a boat, and said, I'm going to take care of you through this. Before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he got Lot and ran him out of the city. He said, I'm going to take care of you through this. As the death angel passed over Egypt, he took the people of God, put them in their house. It says, and when he saw the blood, he passed over them. Why? Because the Lord will always take care of his people. Amen. He's done it before. He'll do it again. That's his position. Here's our second one. I want you to consider his petition. Would you say that with me? His petition. His position is that he is a blind beggar named the son of uncleanliness. But consider his petition. Your Bible says, when he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing through Jericho, he began to cry out, and he began to shout. Come on. I think Bartimaeus was a Bible reader. I think he had the wherewithal to make the connection that not only was he in Jericho, but he made the connection that Jericho had victory through a shout. Come on. So that when he considers his blindness and the fact that he is in poverty and the fact that he is born into a family known for uncleanliness, perhaps he said, the only way I'm going to get through this is with my praise. Amen. Maybe he said, the only way I'm going to make it through this is with a shout unto God. I just want to remind you, this isn't time to stay quiet. If there was ever a time to give God glory, it's now. If there was ever a time to give God praise, it's today. I'm not concerned with, with our characteristics, our personality. It has nothing to do with that. But the simple fact that we are here today and God's grace has covered us and we have made it this far. Ebenezer, the Lord has helped us thus far. I just believe that God deserves our praise. He deserves every clapping hand, every waving hand, every stomping foot, every, every nodding hand. He, he deserves our praise. I don't care what happens in the world. The Bible says if the mountains be removed and cast into the sea, guess what? He's still on the throne. You can fight over toilet paper if you want to. But guess what? He's still on the throne. Make your own hand sanitizer, but he's still on the throne. He's still on the throne. Somebody say that with me today. He's still on the throne. It wasn't just the fact that he shouted. It's what he shouted. Everyone was telling him, Jesus of Nazareth is here. Bartimaeus didn't call him that. He called him Jesus, son of David. Everyone was referring to his humanity. Bartimaeus said, this is not mere humanity. He recognized his divinity. He said, this is more than a carpenter's son. This is not just Jesus of Nazareth. He says, this is Jesus, the son of David. Watch his petition. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. 
I've explained this repeatedly behind this pulpit. That grace is when you receive what you don't deserve. And mercy is when you don't receive what you do deserve. Amen. Amen. And I want the conviction, I know this sounds harsh, huh? I want the conviction that maybe we do deserve judgment. Maybe our earth does deserve judgment. A biblical impending promise, Deuteronomy 28, that if we disobey and violate His commandment and ignore His voice, He says, will I not bring calamity on the earth? Come on. And so forgive me if I sound insensitive. I'm not trying to be a gloom and doom preacher, but I think to a certain degree you have to have enough recognition to say that maybe we do deserve judgment for our sin, for... God, for turning our back on God. For being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. For being more self-centered than God-centered. Not just sins of commission, sins of omission. And yet, it's in that recognition of confession that you're able to pray, God, even though we do deserve it, have mercy. Have mercy. And before I finish this sermon this week, early this week, that was my prayer. Lord, just have mercy on us. Have mercy on my family. Have mercy on our church. Have mercy on our city. Have, have mercy on our nation. God, have mercy on China. Have, have mercy on Iran. Have, have mercy on Italy. God, every nation in the world, have mercy on us, God. I, I know we messed up. I, I know we don't deserve you. But God, have mercy on us. And would you just pray that with me a few seconds right there where you are? Lord, have mercy on us, God. Just have mercy, Lord. We call out to you, God, like, like Bartimaeus, and say, Jesus, have, have mercy on us. Have mercy. Uh, watch this. As, as Bartimaeus prayed, I like this part. When he shouted unto Christ and said, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Watch this. Your Bible says that Jesus stood still. He stopped in his tracks. Come on. You have to understand where Jesus is going. He's not going to Jericho. He's passing through Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. You remember the gospel narrative. Nothing could keep Jesus from the cross. Satan tried to keep Jesus from the cross. He couldn't. He said, I'm on my way to the cross. Peter said, no, I'll never let this happen. Peter tried to keep Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus rebuked Peter. And on his way to the cross, the only thing that made him stop in his tracks was this man's prayer of mercy. You see, we often talk about how prayer moves God and how prayer makes God move. I submit to you this afternoon, there is a type of prayer that makes Come on. God stand still. Wow. Come on. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. I know you need scripture for that. Remember when David sinned and numbered Israel? God gave him three options of judgment. This is what David chose. He said, we'll choose three days of pestilence and disease over our people. And on that third day, as the angel of the Lord is smiting individuals, David intercedes and says, Lord, they're not the ones that sinned. I sinned. I, I messed up. Have mercy on us. And you know what your Bible says? It says, and the angel of the Lord stood still. Come on. Come on. There is a prayer and there is an intercession that will make the Lord stay still. Joshua made the sun Stand still with his prayer. Bartimaeus makes the sun, S-O-N, stand still with his prayer. We all know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray. Remember last year we woke up at 7, 14 to pray. 7, 14 in the evening we were praying. We forget the verse before it. Do you know what 2 Chronicles 7, 13 says? If I shut up the heavens, that there be no rain, and if I send pestilence and disease among the people, Come on. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, yeah. 
and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Prayer is still the answer. I said prayer is still the answer. Prayer still works. Prayer still moves mountains. Prayer still works. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. That's his position. Secondly, it's his petition. 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 Here's my last one. I'll let you let you go. Here's our third one. His prescription. Mm. I worked hard on this. At least say that. <laughs> his position, his petition, here is his prescription. prescription. <laughs> uh, because I like this. Now, here's the, where the narrative shifts. Jesus not only stops in his tracks, but he tells the people around him, he said, go call Bartimaeus to me. Mm, come on. And tell him, take courage and get come up. Amen. Amen. Praise you, God. I came to preach to somebody this afternoon and tell you, take courage and get up. Yeah. Amen. Come on. I know some of you may be too embarrassed to admit that you're scared and afraid and have doubts perhaps not of sickness perhaps it's affecting your wages we don't know how we're going to have income or how we're going to survive or did we buy enough food are my children going to be safe I don't think there's anything inherently wrong for asking those questions but I just came to tell you today take courage and get up be alert not alarmed. Amen. Be insulated, not isolated. Amen. Move in faith, yes. not in fear. Amen. Take courage yes. and get up. The Amen. Lord is Hallelujah. with you. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand by your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. If God be for you, who can stand against you? No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Amen. He that is with me is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Take courage and be of good cheer. In this world, we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. Take courage and get up. Why? He's calling you. He's calling you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, that's what I wanted to tell you this afternoon. Take courage. Here's your prescription for the next two weeks. Take courage. Get up because he's calling you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that because it was Bartimaeus who's been calling out to God. And, and as Erwin says, the Lord flips the script. <laughs> and now the tables have turned. I'm a little older. The tables have turned. <laughs> And now Jesus says, you called out to me, let me call out to you now. I don't know who this is for. You've been calling out to God for a while. There, there's some things you've been praying on that you haven't heard yet. Just keep praising, keep shouting, keep, keep giving, keep serving, keep interceding, keep believing. Why? Because God's about to turn things around and you're about to hear his voice. He's about to call out to you and say, I've not abandoned you, I've not forgotten, I have heard your prayers. I've heard your prayers. Hallelujah. It says, and he jumped up and he came to Jesus. Yes. He hears your prescription for the next two weeks. Take courage, get yes. up, and come to Jesus. Yes. Yes. If you're out of school or you have limited work hours for the next two weeks, please don't turn this into a free-for-all, non-stop Netflix binge. You're better than that. Amen. Yes. Amen. Come on, teenagers, don't gain 15, 20 pounds just eating potato chips and laying in bed for the next two weeks. Pastor, what do I do? Take courage, get up, and come to Jesus. Be wise. If you have some extra time in the next two weeks, enroll in an online course. Study a book of the Bible. Write some sermons, Bible school students. Have a prayer gathering with two or three people. You don't want to get with people? Do it online. Call people in the morning. Say, look, we're going to get through this. Let's pray together. Take courage. Get up and come to Jesus. Refinance your house. I think that's what we're doing this week. We're going to refinance our house. Jesus 
Jesus says to him, Bartimaeus, your faith has made you whole. Amen. Your faith has made you well. What faith? Well, watch this. Bartimaeus showed faith when he responded to what he heard about Jesus. He showed faith when he based his request in God's mercy. He showed faith when he persisted when others told him to stay quiet. He showed faith when he got up because Jesus said to. He showed faith when he threw aside his cloak. He showed faith when, he's made, when he made his request known unto Christ. Amen. He showed faith when he said, I'm leaving everybody else behind and I'm following Amen. you, Jesus. Amen. He showed faith when he shouted unto God. He showed faith when he believed in his heart. He showed faith when he began to intercede. Amen. Bartimaeus is a man of faith. Watch this. It says, and the Lord said, go. And he didn't do that. No, he did not. <laughs> he said, Lord, with all due respect, paraphrasing, if I go anywhere... I'm coming with you. It says, and he started following Jesus. Why is that significant? Watch this. Before you clap too hard on that one, you have to know where he's following Jesus. Because the next verse, Mark 11, verse 1, says, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. We're almost at the end of the book. Why is he going to Jerusalem? Because a week from then, he's going to be crucified, buried, and resurrected. Bartimaeus falls out of the narrative. We don't know how long he followed Jesus for. We don't know if he actually made it all the way to Jerusalem with him. It simply says that he started following and walking with Christ on his way to Jerusalem. He's there in Jerusalem. The greatest act ever committed on this earth would be done. Christ would offer up himself for the sins of all of us. Do you know why it's called the coronavirus? It's because under an ele electron microscope, that one molecule of the virus is surrounded with these little sharp points of protein. And it gives it the visual illusion of a crown. Thus aptly named the coronavirus. Crowns for centuries have been worn by kings and queens alike as a symbol of power and authority and sovereignty. And yet it's there in Jerusalem where he's betrayed by one of his closest friends. From there goes through a series of kangaroo trials. And a select few from the mob encircled Christ, placed a scarlet robe over him, put a staff in his hand for a makeshift scepter. Some spat upon him, others mockingly bowed down before him as they declared and chanted, Hail, King of the Jews! And to top off and seal the mockery, they went to a thorny bush and crafted a crude crown. And my Jesus wore that crown for me. Wore that crown on the whipping post. Amen. Hallelujah. As his blood was shed for the remission of my sin and the healing of my body and the transforming of my mind. Wore that cross as they drove nine inch nails through his wrists and his feet wore that crown on the place of the skull where he was crucified. He wore the crown. He wore it because Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 53 and verse 4. Surely he has carried our infirmities and surely he has carried our griefs. Yet we esteemed him not he was smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed. It's at the cross. I don't even know if you realize this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus already defeated the coronavirus. He already paid for the healing necessary. He wore a crown that 
coronavirus might surrender and bow down to his magnificence and his majesty. Amen. 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 And I don't know how God's going to do it. Yeah. But I do believe if he's done it before, he can do it again. Stand to your feet with me this afternoon. Hallelujah.